Hey guys I'm Yurizi. This story is all about what if Naruto was the owner of a cafe diner. Even the gods and goddesses of Olympus needed a day off. Sometimes they needed time away from the constant bickering and never-ending controversies of their family. On one such day, Wisdom and Moon found themselves discovering a hidden gem within the city that never sleeps, and meeting a familiar blonde knucklehead with a penchant for the color orange. Before we proceed with the story, please like and subscribe to this channel if you liked the video and don't forget to check the description for the other works of the author if you liked the story. Let's start. Chapter 13, Part 13 You look ready to keel over. Blinking as he lowered her latte to the table, Naruto turned and faced the gazing gray eyes of Athena, ignoring the crumbs splotched across the side of her lips. The goddess of wisdom arrived at the fox's den 40 minutes ago, this time on her own. Though she invited Artemis, her younger sister was in the middle of a hunt somewhere out in California, and whatever she was hunting was giving her girls the runaround. The excitement in her sister's voice was enough for her to wish her hunt good luck before settling on leaving Olympus alone. She narrowly avoided a run-in with Aphrodite, hiding her presence from the goddess of love as she skipped her way over to Dionysus's temple. Though part of her wondered why Olympus's resident airhead was heading over to the temple of the family drunk, she chose to leave that question unanswered. She doubted it was anything of significance. Once she arrived, she took up residence in the corner of the room away from prying eyes and made herself comfortable. Her schedule of late was meetings with her servants, her father, and other members of her family. The moment a free afternoon opened up, Athena had only one place in mind to spend her free time. I'm sorry. I said you look ready to keel over. You look like you haven't slept a wink in days. Athena replied, taking the drink and pushing her empty plate to the side of the table. Is everything all right? Straightening his back, he brought up his free hand and rubbed his eyes. Dark purple circles were beginning to form under his eyes like someone had snuck into Aphrodite's enormous collection of cosmetics and smeared purple mascara all around the skin. I'm okay, he replied, rubbing the bridge of his nose, I'm tired is all. Haven't been sleeping great, that's all. Athena hummed. Trying to ignore the delicious aroma of her drink as it tickled her nose, the goddess didn't believe him. Tired? That's putting it mildly. You look exhausted. She leaned back in her chair and appeared amused when he attempted to cover his mouth when a yawn tried to escape. When was the last time you took a break? A low hum escaped Naruto, I haven't had the chance yet today. Maybe in an hour, I can have a sit down. The schools will break up for the day soon, and that should give me the time to relax a bit. He wouldn't mind being off his feet for a little bit. Maybe he could have a clone take over in the front, while he put his feet up for 20 minutes in the back room. It was risky since his clones always ran the risk of accidentally dispelling if someone or something knocked into them hard enough. I don't mean when was the last time you had a sit down, Naruto. Beneath the table, the goddess tapped her foot against the hardwood flooring, I should clarify. When was the last time you took a day off? A chuckle escaped his lips, I don't have days off. Running the den takes up most of my time. Then perhaps you should look into making some changes. Working the way you do can't be healthy. It doesn't help that you work alone. I don't think I have seen another soul working here since my first visit. As much as she loved coming to the fox's den, questions started hovering in the back of her mind, which so far, had gone unanswered. Like her sister, Athena had a good thing going at the den, and like Artemis, was developing a soft spot for the blonde owner. He was vastly different from the other mortal men that she met, and so far hadn't made a pass at her like most already would have. He appeared more interested in getting to know her in a friendly manner, making small talk between her orders and listening with rapt attention when she spoke. I have my Sundays off. A tisk sound came from the goddess, no, you have half of Sunday off. The other half you're here working. She took another sip of her drink, trying to remain composed as the taste of cinnamon covered her taste buds, I know you value your work, but I think you should put some thought into closing the den for one day a week. Sunday would work best since you're only open half a day anyway. Not to mention, you wouldn't be the only one who closes on a Sunday. Sunday was known to be a day of rest, and not only because the faux god's religion told people it was so. Sunday had always been a day where mortals would lay down their worries and take a day to relax and put their feet up. For most people, 
Sunday was their favorite day of the week, while Monday was typically the worst since it began the working week anew. The blonde sighed with one hand coming up to rub his neck. It would be nice to have a day where I didn't have to think about coffee or pastries other than my own. In the four months since he opened up, he was focusing his time on the fox's den 24-7 and left little time for himself. For someone of his unique circumstance, that was hard to do. Working at the den gave him a purpose. Boredom and doing nothing was the enemy and staying occupied by any means, or manner was in his mind the solution. Add a demigod like Thalia coming into a mix, and entering his life. You don't think the customers would mind. A snort escaped Athena and shook her head, I think they would be more annoyed if you keeled over during service. Everyone needs rest. Even the best of us. That's true. He briefly glanced at the window, I guess I could make up a sign and stick it in the window today. There is still enough time in the day to give people the heads up. The goddess nodded when a thought crossed her mind, you know, this would all be a lot easier on you if you hired someone to help you. A frown appeared on his face, and she watched as Naruto casually waved the idea away, maybe. We'll see. The idea of hiring someone to come in a couple of days a week and help him during some of the busier days had crossed his mind on more than one occasion. The big glaring issue that Naruto had with bringing someone from the outside into the fox's den was having to explain why there were multiple versions of himself working endlessly in the kitchen. His abilities played a role in the upkeep of the den and bringing someone in would complicate matters. I never said you weren't, but having someone to help carry the load of running a business would help. I'm no businesswoman but having someone else around, even playing the role of waiter or waitress would help make things easier on you. Athena wasn't trying to discredit him. Far from it. Thus far, the mortal had done a superb job on running a business all on his own. She didn't want to see her favorite mortal wear himself down. It would help a great deal. I'm just saying. She shrugged nonchalantly. Yeah, I get what you mean, and I appreciate the advice, Naruto replied, I'll think about it. One step at a time. Athena smiled, one step at a time. His eyes drifted away from Athena and down to the book in her hands. The book looked old if the leather-bound cover was anything to go by, but appeared in pristine condition. On the side, he noticed gold stitching and letting, and tilted his head to read the title, The Old Man and the Sea. Athena hummed, confirming his statement and taking another sip of her drink. That's an old one. How far are you? About halfway, but then again, the story is only 127 pages. Athena's free hand came up and traced along the spine of the book, I haven't read it in a couple of years, so I thought I would spend an afternoon re-experiencing it. Though she had another copy within her ever-expanding library within her temple, the one she held in her hands was a gift from Ernest Hemingway himself, who had been one of her demigod brain children born at the tail end of the 19th century. Intelligent beyond his year. He'd thrown himself into writing during his time in Paris in the 1920s, and the goddess of wisdom had watched with rapt attention as her son became influenced by the modernist writers and artists of the lost generation. Despite the many stories he produced, the old man and the sea was a favorite of hers. Naruto hummed, taking a skin of the room to check his customers were all satisfied before he quoted, he always thought of the sea as la mar which is what people call her in Spanish when they love her. Sometimes those who love her say bad things about her but they are always said as though she were a woman. Some of the younger fishermen, those who used boys as floats for their lines and had motorboats, bought when the shark livers had brought much money, spoke of her as Elmar which is masculine. The smile on Athena's face widened, they spoke of her as a contestant or a place or even an enemy. But the old man always thought of her as feminine and as something that gave or withheld great favors, and if she did wild or wicked things it was because she could not help them. The moon affects her as it does a woman. When she finished speaking, the goddess couldn't help leaning forward, one arm resting against the top of the table, you've read the old man and the sea. It came out as a statement rather than a question. Regardless, the blonde nodded. Some years ago. As you said, it's a good book. He laughed. What's so funny? It's just, he started, and couldn't help the grin morphing on his face, when I was a kid. I would be throwing a tantrum at the idea of reading a book. Looking back on his youth, Naruto often forgot how much of a knucklehead he was. 
It was no wonder he got on the nerves of so many of his fellow shinobi, including those he called friends and family. I was a bit of a hothead when I was younger, and the idea of reading a book would have sent me running for the hills. Really? Athena tried to picture Naruto as a kid, and couldn't help inwardly smiling. She imagined a spiky blonde running for the hills while being chased by his teachers. Oh yeah, but I found the value you in it as I grew up. A fond smile and a faraway look washed over his face, my godfather was an author, and it was his first book that ignited my enjoyment of books, he chuckled, he, didn't have the best of luck with more traditional stories, but did find success in the more, risque section. Athena raised an eyebrow. Risque section. Naruto wiggled his eyebrows and gave Athena a look. It took seconds for Athena to understand what he meant. The blonde felt a chill run up his spine, and a frosty look appeared. Her gray eyes turned steely. I see. Athena's thoughts about Naruto started to darken before he put up his free hand. She didn't want to summon her spear. Don't worry. I could barely make it through the first couple of pages. Those kinds of books aren't my taste. Despite Jiraiya's attempts, he never fell to the dark side. So you never got sucked into that vortex of debauchery. Athena muttered and watched him nod his head, good. That type of, literature has no place in the world. It's little more than smut and pornography. Though it wasn't to her tastes, that kind of reading was up Aphrodite's alley. The occasions when she found the love goddess with her nose buried between the pages of a book, it was often one of those silly little love stories, and occasionally, straight-up pornography. The air-headed goddess that oversaw the carnal pleasures in life had been the one responsible for showing Apollo the joys of literature, despite her attempts at steering her godly brother away. You don't have to tell me twice, Naruto replied, I keep a set of his books for sentimental value. They've never even left their protective wrapping. Athena nodded, pleased by his words, good. See that you don't. I would be greatly disappointed if I ever catch you reading such content. I doubt I would be able to call you a friend if I had such information in my mind. My sister would be less than thrilled too. She could already imagine her sister if she ever discovered such a trait in their favorite mortal. She would string you up in the trees and poke you full of holes. Oddly enough, I could see your sister doing that. Naruto tapped his chin, she seems a little scary when crossed. His words brought out a laugh from Athena, oh, you have no idea. Whatever words the blonde was about to say died in his mouth when he heard one of his other customers call out his name. He must have lost track of time. He'd been standing there talking to the grey-eyed woman for a while. It appears you're needed elsewhere. Looks that way, Naruto replied. The blonde turned to go and serve the other customers before a thought crossed his mind. He turned his head back to Athena, asking, quick question. You called us friends. Would you consider us friends? Athena tilted her head. Her expression read she wasn't expecting the question, though it did make her begin to wonder that herself. As mortals go Naruto was one of the best she had met in a long time, and the goddess of wisdom had to admit, being in his presence was coming. Not to mention, his culinary talents worked wonders on her taste buds. Are we friends? She said aloud, thinking it over for a brief moment before nodding, yes. I think so. I've visited numerous times now, and we've gotten along since day one. Coming here is often the highlight of my day. Do you consider me a friend? I do. Then, I suppose we're friends. A bright smile lit up the blonde's face, in that case, can I ask you for a small favor? Oh? Now she was curious. A favor? Well, if it's within my power, then I can try, though it would depend on what it is. It's nothing strenuous if that's what you're thinking, he said back, you see, I've got some new additions I'd like to put on the menu, but I'd like someone to taste them for me. If you're available, then dash. I'd love to. She blurted out her response, before quickly throwing her hands to her mouth. She hadn't meant to reply with such excitement, but her mouth moved on its own before her mind could catch up. A rarity when it concerned a goddess of her status. However, she wasn't going to miss the opportunity for what Naruto was offering. How could she say no? She could only imagine what kind of delicacies he had in mind. Gently coughing into her hand, 
she straightened her back and regained her dignified look, what I meant to say is that I would be happy to help. Tell me a time, and I will see to it that I'm available. Deep down, Athena wanted the opportunity to laud it over the likes of Artemis and Aphrodite. None of the other goddesses received an opportunity like this, and she wasn't about to turn it down. Though she was one of the more patient Olympians living on Olympus, she was looking forward to rubbing that in their faces. Great. If you're available, how about tonight? I'll close up around 8 as normal. Head over around then. Perfect. I'll see you then. She tried not to sound so eager, but she couldn't deny how excited she was feeling. Evening rolled around quickly, and the goddess of wisdom soon found herself back at the fox's den. The rest of her afternoon had been uneventful, though a brief run-in with Aphrodite led her to believe the goddess of love had discovered her evening plans. The sneaky love goddess had spies and snitches in every corner of the world like she was some type of lovey-dovey mob boss. Nymphs of every kind flocked to her side with a snap of her fingers, all trying to find favor with the beautiful Olympian. Nymphs enjoyed gossip and spreading rumors almost as much as the deities of Olympus did. Luckily, Dite's attention was elsewhere today, and Athena managed to slip away before the interrogation could begin. The jingle from the bell rang as she entered the fox's den for the second time that day, and Naruto's voice reached out to her from the back room. He must have been in the kitchen preparing for her visit. Athena? Is that you? Yes, it's me. She replied, looking around the room. It was strange to see it void of other people. Ever since her first visit with Artemis, the place was always filled with mortals as Naruto's reputation became well known in the West Village area and beyond. The scent of coffee and chocolate still lingered in the air, and a couple of used coffee mugs and plates still dotted around the tables. The last customer must have left mere moments before she appeared. Great, right on time. Take a seat anywhere you like, and I'll be out in a moment. She heard him reply, can I get you a drink? Athena thought about it for a moment, I won't say no to a regular coffee. She could picture him nodding in the back, you got it. I'll be out shortly. Take your time. Also, could you make it a decaf? You got it. The goddess only waited a couple of minutes before the blonde revealed himself. He appeared the same as he did earlier in the day, though she noticed a fresh new apron wrapped around his waist. Bits of jam and flour covered his wrists, though a towel was held in one hand. He got started on her drink, and it wasn't long before she had the mug sitting between her palms. Thanks again for doing this. I hope I'm not causing any inconvenience. Athena shook her head, causing a few strands of hair to fall over her face. Naruto never noticed how her hair curled at the end since the woman tended to have her hair done up in a bun or a ponytail of some kind. Tonight, her hair was down and swept down one side. He wouldn't voice his thoughts, but he thought the look suited her. He wondered why she didn't do it more often, it's not a problem. My evening was free, and I wasn't about to turn down the chance to try some of your new additions to the menu. Naruto let out a chuckle, well, I can't argue with that. He pointed behind him, so, I've got a couple of new desserts I'm thinking about adding to the menu. What I need is you to tell me if it's good or not. I want an unbiased opinion, and since day one, you've struck me as someone who will tell it straight. Athena let out a chuckle of her own, you would be correct. I never saw the need to beat around the bush, as it were. Well, that's perfect. That's what I'm looking for. Her grey eyes watched him closely as he fidgeted around on the spot, just one small thing I want to add. If she looked closely enough, she could have sworn dust of red washed over his cheeks, I know you can be a little, how we say, vocal when eating food here, and you get embarrassed by it. I want you to know that it's okay if you want to. He made hand motions in the air reminiscent of Jez's hands, I promise, this is a safe space. Athena sputtered a quick response, but the surprise of his words momentarily made her mind stall. Taking a moment to compose herself, she gave him a subtle nod, I will keep that in mind. He gave a thumbs up, okay. I'll go and get the first one. Athena waited until he was out of sight before throwing up her hands and letting out a silent scream. She writhed around on the chair, silently stamping her feet on the floor, I'm never going to be rid of that damn incident, am I? One slip up, and it was going to haunt her forever. It was the incident with the flute all over again. At least, 
This time it was only Artemis who saw her, and she wasn't the type to spread such information around without just cause. She didn't have to be worried about other members of her family finding out, and she doubted Naruto would spread it around. She couldn't have been the only person who'd done such a thing. She composed herself as the blonde returned from the kitchen, a plate on the tips of his fingers. Unknowingly, Athena licked her lips. At first glance, the sweet treat in front of her looks like a cupcake given the size, but the texture looked more reminiscent of a biscuit. On the top of the pastry, a swirl of cream covered the top with a layer of something dusted over like a gold blanket. Three sat in front of her. This is a cupcake size honey cheesecake, Naruto explained, sounding pleased at her reaction, you're probably wondering what the cream on the top is. Athena nodded. It's cream mixed with cream cheese and honey. The base is made of biscuits, as is the sprinkles of crumbs dusted over the top. It's a bit different. I'm not even sure how I came up with it. The idea of it just struck me like a bolt of lightning. Athena could do nothing but stare and nod, before finally asking, how in the world do you come up with these recipes? It's beautiful to look at. He gave a small bow and chuckled, well, thanks, but ideally, I'd like my customers to eat it, rather than stare at it. The goddess of wisdom let out a low chuckle, fair point. Then I should fulfill my part of the deal. Gently, Athena picked up the small pastry between her fingers. In hand, she could feel how delicate the base was. It felt like it would crumble with the tiniest degree of extra pressure. The last thing she wanted to watch it crumble away before her very eyes. Bringing it to her mouth, she took a small bite out of the side, getting enough of the cream to get a real sense of the flavor. She breathed through her nose audibly, and her eyes grew heavy all of a sudden as a burst of flavor took over her sense of taste. As expected, the second she bit down on the pastry, it crumbled away, coating her tongue with the base. Leaning forward, she rested her hand in her free palm, her toes wriggling against the inside of her shoes as she took delight in the dish. Well? Naruto asked, waiting patiently. Athena idly glanced at him, too caught up in the cupcake size honey cheesecake, do you even need to ask? Was her expression not enough? Thankfully, she managed to rein in any audible moans from slipping out, it's amazing. The honey flavor isn't too overpowering. Not at all. I'll admit, I don't have honey often, but this was just the right amount. It wasn't too sweet. And the cream. Light and fluffy. She replied, and the biscuit base crumbled as soon as my teeth put the tiniest bit of pressure on it. It was a delightful sensation. Good. That's good. He looked relieved, and scratched the back of his head, I was a little worried about this one. There was no reason to be. You did a wonderful job as always. Quickly finishing it off, Athena wiped away the crumbs and splash of cream from her lips, you get a gold star for plate number one. He smiled, thanks. That's a relief to hear. I've been cooking and balking for a long time, but I still get the jitters when I'm trying something new. Lacing her fingers together, Athena smiled. She did that a lot when she was visiting the fox's den. Something about the company of the man that ran it brought it out of her. I'll go get the next one. He replied, and disappeared back in the kitchen. He was only gone a few short moments, but while the goddess was alone, she dropped her usual facade and punched the air in delight. Her feet repeatedly tapped the ground as she reveled in the aftertaste of the honey cheesecake. It was so good she couldn't contain herself and had to let it out, though when Naruto returned, she quickly regained her composure. Like before, he gently lowered the plate to the table, pushing the first one off to the side. Athena nearly told him to leave it where it was, but her words fell silent as her eyes settled on the second dish. A drinking glass filled with her next sweet treat rested on the top. Unless my eyes are deceiving me, which they rarely do, can I assume I'm looking at a pun Nakata? The blonde almost grinned at her guess, you have a good eye. He watched Athena pick it up, looking over it with an analytical look on her face and resting her nose against the rim of the glass. She took one long whiff and felt a shiver of delight run across her skin, a strawberry pun nakata, as you figured out. A pun nakata was an Italian dessert made of sweetened cream thickened by gelatin. The name literally meant cooked cream. It was a dish Naruto hadn't created much of in the past but decided to give it a shot by adding it to his menu. What are these on the sides? 
Those are homemade salted almond snaps. You can have the panna cotta on its own, but I thought the almond snaps would complement the strawberry flavor. He made a motion towards the spoon, maybe you could tell me. Maybe I can, Athena fired back, and picked up the spoon. Breaking off a piece of the almond snap, the goddess scooped up some of the panna cotta, and gently placed the snap on top. Panna cotta was not a dish she was overly familiar with, though the ones she had in the past were adequate. Perhaps this one would make the dessert a new favorite of hers. It wasn't a dish her aunt, or stepmother, had ever presented them on Olympus. She learned in and chomped down on her spoon. This time, the reaction was a little more, vocal, and there was nothing she could do to contain it. Oh, gods, she whispered, one hand coming up to slide down her cheek. Her ankles crossed over the other beneath the table, and her tongue lapped up every little bit of dessert from the spoon. When it finally left her mouth, there didn't appear to be anything left. Not even a smear of cream. Naruto tried to speak but found his mouth clamped shut as Athena grabbed another spoonful and went for a second bite. She hated that she was making noises that sounded so lewd, but she couldn't help it. Naruto told her that he wouldn't tell anyone, so she put her trust in that. And then a third. By the fourth bite, she deliberately took her time. Well, I guess I don't need to ask, huh? Athena shook her head. A minute passed, and Naruto found himself lifting the empty glass of Pun Nakata. The goddess devoured the dish like there was no tomorrow. So much so, that the inside of the glass looked half clean already from how feverishly she'd eaten it. She made sure to scoop up every last piece she could get her hands on. There wasn't even a sliver of cream left at the bottom of the glass. He was beginning to wonder which was the gluttonous daughter of Zeus. If you don't put that on your menu, then it will be a crime of the highest order, she told him, dabbing her lips with a napkin. She would readily order that again, the cream was perfect. I haven't had a pun nakata in a long time, but I can say this trumps any I've had in the past. From how quickly you polished that off, I'd be foolish to disagree, he laughed. Thanks for saying so. That's another one going on the menu. At this rate, your menu will feel like it has no end. When inspiration hits, you have to go with it. You don't know when it might come back. Athena nodded, I agree. Without a moment's notice, her embarrassment swiftly returned as loud gurgle ran through her stomach. There was little she could do to stop it and felt it travel up her body so quickly there was no time to cover her mouth. Once the sensation ran along the back of her throat she knew there was nothing she could do to stop it. A loud and guttural burp escaped her mouth, resonating inside the silent room. It sounded disgusting, like something Ares or Apollo would do. It wasn't something anyone from her family would think she was capable of. Even Naruto's looked surprised, his mouth a tiny O-shape. I, I am so sorry you had to hear that. She threw her hands up to cover her face, hoping it would help her disappear. Gods, why did it always happen to her? Was Tick playing some kind of prank on her? Her luck surely wasn't that bad, was it? She half expected him to turn away in disgust, but instead, he let out a loud bellyful laugh that nearly made her jump out of her seat. She sat there for half a minute, watching in silence as he tried to compose himself. Initially, when he tried to speak, he broke out into a fit of chuckles and resumed laughing, until finally, he managed to get himself under control. He wiped his eyes, a sheen of wetness coating the bottom from his hysterics. I, I am sorry, he said, waving his hands in the air. His expression still showed he was trying not to crack up, it was just so sudden, and out of nowhere. You caught me by surprise. Both of us, if your expression was anything to go by. Athena shook her head and tried to bury her face into her palms again. Instead, she found a gentle hand on her wrist and gently pried it away. Her initial reaction was to blast the man who dared to place his hand on her. The goddess of wisdom wasn't as bad as her sister, but as virgin goddess, she was very particular about who touched her. She had a reputation to uphold after all. The only male she allowed to touch her was Zeus, as she had grown up with her father spoiling her and wrapping her up in those giant arms of his into a hug. Her Olympian brothers tried in the past to get handsy with her though they all came to regret it. They only needed to be told once, or twice in Apollo's case, and they never tried anything again. The sight of her spear in hand would make all of them turn tail. 
Her spear could appear in a matter of moments in a brilliant light. It was as easy as blinking when it came to summoning her signature weapon to her. She could skewer the one daring to touch her in a nanosecond. Luckily, she refrained. The soft smile and eyes belonging to her mortal friend were enough to push such thoughts away. Don't get upset, he said kindly, gently patting her wrist, I'm sorry my laughing upset you. It wasn't my intention. It just came out. You surprised me, that's all. Athena took a couple of deep breaths, I it's fine. It's silly, I know, but, Athena paused and ran her free hand through her hair, I don't take embarrassment well. Ever since the incident with the flute all those millennia ago, the goddess has kept a close eye on every little thing she did and said. After every speech and every action, she ensured she didn't hand over any ammunition to her immortal family. She couldn't handle the Japs, and being the butt of the joke. To this day, the laughter of her aunts, uncles, and siblings still rang through her head from time to time. The curse of being the goddess of wisdom was that she never forgot such things. It was all stored in her memory, like a file cabinet that went on forever, I'm sorry. Embarrassment for her brethren, like Apollo, or Hermes, was second nature to them. They used it to their gain and appeared to shrug it off and keep moving forward regardless. It was one of the few things she could say she was envious for lacking. She wished she could just walk away from such things. The chair next to her made a sound, and she found Naruto taking up the seat, don't apologize. You don't have anything to be sorry for. I know, but dash. Stop right there, he interrupted, cutting Athena off mid-sentence, getting embarrassed is nothing to beat yourself up over. It happens to everyone. Just the other day, I accidentally knocked into a customer, and part of their drink fell on their lap. Hot coffee right on their white shirt, stained across the front. The customer was annoyed, and I could feel the stares coming from everyone in the room. She nodded, I hate that feeling. Like people are judging you. Yeah, I can't deny it doesn't suck, but it doesn't last. You think you have to apologize over and over again to make it better when in reality, you should have stopped after the first time. It's in the past. It's history. You have to stay in the present, rather than looking back and thinking about that moment. It was one little incident. After that, the rest of the day went great. You have to stop clinging onto those moments. I wish it were that easy, Athena replied, sounding a little glum, with Naruto sighing at her reply. This goddess sure could be a Debbie Downer at the smallest of things. Naruto rubbed the back of his neck, you don't always have to be perfect, you know. You're allowed to make mistakes. Athena's eyes widened from his declaration. She stared at him in surprise. She hadn't expected that response. She wasn't sure what she was expecting, but it hadn't been that. What do you mean? It came out little more than a whisper, but Naruto heard her and explained. We haven't known each other for a long time, but I've met people like you before. You're the type of person who sets unbelievably high standards for themselves. Anything less than achieving that you deem a failure, an embarrassment. Did you know embarrassment belongs to the disorder known as perfectionism? Think about it. You are embarrassed because you didn't live up to your standards, and when an event happens that put us on the spot and doesn't go our way, we panic and become flushed. There is a small, or wide, gap between your expectations of yourself and your performance. Athena did know that, but she didn't voice it. She was too interested in what he had to say. He wasn't wrong about his statement on being perfect. After all, she was Athena, the goddess of wisdom and favorite daughter of Zeus. When everyone else had a problem, they came to her for help. Naruto could see she was listening, and continued, Embarrassment is also another term for fear. We don't want to be perceived less than the image we desire. You need to have that wiggle room up here, and not let yourself be bugged down by that. He tapped his head, you don't have to take it personally. She knew that, but she couldn't help it. Her pride wouldn't let her. What if I can't help it? He gave her a look, you can help it, and you can start by not looking at yourself always standing on a pedestal. Things happen outside of our control. That doesn't make us any less than what we are. You make it sound easy. It can be if we let it. He replied, and outstretched his hand and patted Athena on the shoulder. Again, the goddess felt the urge to swat his hand away but restrained herself. 
It felt oddly comforting, the next time you feel embarrassed, hold your head up high and laugh it away. Don't let it weigh you down. It's a single moment. People will forget and move on to the next thing that catches their attention. Athena didn't say anything, but his words rang through her mind. She had the same talk from her Aunt Hestia on multiple occasions in the past. Even Artemis pulled her aside a few times. She took note of their kind words of encouragement over the millennia but hearing them coming from a mortal held a different weight to them. Here was this person, a being of lesser worth in comparison to an immortal goddess, telling her to stop taking herself so seriously. It was a sobering experience. Yet she couldn't deny his words didn't hold weight to them. He was correct, as much as she loathes to admit it. It was hard not to put herself on the pedestal he spoke off. Everyone on Olympus came to her when they had a problem. When something outside her control put the image people had of her at risk, she panicked and fled, whether it was a tiny incident or a big one. Feeling Naruto's kind eyes and smile lingering, Athena took a calming breath, trying to control the flush on her face and the thoughts running through her head. She knew he was only trying to help, for which she was grateful. He really was a unique mortal. I, I will try, though I don't know how successful I'll be. She admitted, her hands wrapping around her half-empty coffee mug and feeling comfort from its warmth. She watched him raise his hand and noticed it sway in the air as if he was debating with himself before she felt his hand come down on her shoulder. If you ever feel that way again, just come back to the den. My door is always open to you. His smile widened, and Athena tried not to look surprised when he sent a wink her way and quickly removed his hand, think of this place as a home away from home. Somewhere you can decompress. We can even talk about our favorite books if you like. Help take your mind off things. He shrugged but chuckled when he saw her gray eyes light up. Aye aye, she started but found herself at a loss for words as she tried to reason with him that he didn't need to go that far. Instead, she settled on just two, thank you. You're welcome. He replied, ready to keep going? I've got some tasty dishes in the back with your name on them. Athena nodded, I'm ready. Please bring out the next one. Olympus. As the evening came to an end, Athena reappeared within her temple of Olympus, a small and content smile gracing her face. Sitting comfortably in her hands was a white box with a blue ribbon tied around it, containing a gift from the mortal she spent the last hour helping. Choosing to spend the rest of her night in her library and tucking into a good book, Athena kicked off her shoes and replaced them with her favorite pair of gray slippers. Her civilian clothing changed as well, replaced by an oversized light blue hooded jumper and lounge pants. Despite her earlier feelings of annoyance with herself, there was a noticeable skip to her step. He'd thanked her for her help, and insisted she take something home with her. Gods, she was turning soft. The goofy blonde should count himself lucky she had a soft spot for him. There was something about him that made Athena comfortable to be around. It was like a warmth she didn't know existed until now. It was similar to the way they all felt around the goddess of the hearth. It was peaceful. She didn't know how else to explain it. Unknowingly, a shiver ran down her back and momentarily she stopped and looked at the spots on her body where his hands touched. She noted how warm his hands were before shaking her head and continuing. She couldn't help but let out a small giggle. What has got you so amused, daughter? Turning the corner that led into her reading corner, she was surprised to find her father already occupying one of the armchairs and dressed in his usual business suit attire. In his hands, he held a copy of The Great Gatsby, with a pair of reading glasses sitting on the bridge of his nose. He stared up at her and wore a smile he reserved only for his beloved daughters. Father. She greeted, nodding her head and taking the armchair next to him while placing the box on the coffee table in front of them, is there something I can help you with tonight? I wasn't aware we had a meeting scheduled. Does a father need a reason to visit his daughter? He replied, a twinkle of amusement in his eyes as Athena made herself comfortable, and tucked her feet onto the chair, if truth be told, I'm hiding from your aunt. Which one? I have a couple of them. Hestia. Athena rose a delicate eyebrow. A glimmer of light shone on the coffee table. A teapot appeared in the center with two mugs, a small saucer of milk and pot of sugar along with it. Reaching over to the bookshelf behind her, the goddess lifted over a small jar hidden between Frankenstein and Gone with the Wind. 
Inside was her personal stash of tea bags from England, kept hidden from the likes of Aphrodite or Demeter, so she could enjoy a cup of Earl Grey while reading her novels. Why would you be hiding from Hestia? She asked as she prepared tea for the two of them. Zeus released a sigh. He placed a marker in his book, and put it off to the side, I don't know what has got into her. She came home three days ago, and since then, has been cooking non-stop in her temple and delivering food to the other gods. She's been churning out new and delicious dinners and breakfasts quicker than anyone can blink. You know how we all get when Hestia starts cooking. She even made her famous steak and kidney pie just for me yesterday. She's been making everyone their favorites. Athena did know. Her aunt's food was sought after by everyone, so why are you hiding? Because she's making too much. Zeus patted his stomach and released a tired breath. He felt like his stomach was about to burst through his suit, I haven't felt this stuffed in centuries. What makes it worse is Demeter and Hera eventually got involved, and now the three of them are cooking up a storm in Hestia's temple. They tried to make me their guinea pig, but I hightailed it out of there and led them to Apollo. Hopefully, he can keep the three of them busy for a little while. They always were a formidable trio when they teamed up, she replied and looked amused when she heard her father grumble. With a wave of her hand, the water in the teapot heated up, and she soon found herself gently filling each of the mugs. Handing one to Zeus, who took it with a quiet thank you, she added a splash of milk to her tea and watched as her father added a teaspoon of sugar to his. With another wave of her hand, a plate and fork appeared. Leaning over, she took the box with the blue ribbon and gently peeled it open. Inside, a luscious-looking lemon-baked cheesecake sat untouched. The lemon smell tickled her nose as soon as the lid was opened, making Athena's eyes twinkle. Is that a lemon-baked cheesecake? She heard and found her father leaning over next to her and looking down in the box. It is. If the look on her father's face was any indication, she wouldn't get to enjoy her cheesecake on her own as she hoped, why? Would you like a slice? The god of the sky and king of Olympus licked his lips, maybe just a sliver. Sighing, she conjured up another plate and fork along with a knife. She had been hoping to enjoy the cheesecake by herself, but it seemed luck was not on her side again. Making the initial cut down the middle, she moved the tip a few inches to the left and pushed down. That seemed a sufficient amount for her father. A little bigger. She stopped the knife and looked at her father from the corner of her eye. He was still leaning forward but was giving her an expectant look. A small hum of annoyance escaped her lips but quickly set it aside. She did as asked, and moved the knife along another inch. It was more than she was hoping to give him, but she would not be selfish after the delicious treats she enjoyed earlier. Like before, she pressed the knife down. A little bigger. She stopped again, and this time a frown wove its way onto her face. Her father's expression hadn't changed nor had he moved. He just sat there and watched like an eager dog waiting for his treat. Her eyes visibly darkened, and her hand with the knife visibly twitched but relented. Again, she moved the knife another inch and started to cut down. A little dash. He didn't get to finish as Athena's fist came crashing down on the coffee table, splitting it in two. Zeus almost jumped back in surprise. He didn't speak a word, watching as Athena held the plate up and made one long incision down the middle of the cheesecake. Zeus's plate flew into her hand, and she unceremoniously slapped the delight down on top. Here. She shoved the plate in his hands, a cold and irritated look on her face before turning her back and walking away with her tea in one hand and her half of the cheesecake in the other, tidy up after you're done. She told him, before grumbling something under her breath and disappearing past the bookshelves. Zeus just sat there in silence for a moment, wondering what had gotten into his beloved warflower. He didn't appear to realize how much Athena had been looking forward to enjoying her cheesecake alone, and not sharing it with anyone. Naruto had given her the choice of what she could take home with her. It was hers. Was it something I said? He wondered, unconsciously picking up his fork and bringing a bite of the cheesecake to his mouth. The first thing he tasted was the zest of the lemon flavor and the crumble of the pastry base as it fell apart in his mouth, and couldn't stop the guttural hum of delight from escaping his mouth. Hmm, <laughs> that's pretty damn good. Chapter 14, Part 14 Five minutes to go, Naruto muttered to himself, a frown on his face as he stared up at the clock. 
He stood behind the counter in the fox's den, his arms crossed against his chest as he waited for his reservation to arrive. He had no idea what he was in for, but Hestia had told him he was in for quite the experience. She said it all with a straight face but knew the telltale signs for when she wanted to start laughing. Something of interest was bound to happen within the confines of his workplace but hadn't the faintest idea what it might be. It all started when he agreed to speak with her nephew. The very same nephew who, months before, had been thrown out of the fox's den because he caught him with a young nymph in a very compromising position. If he had his way, the sun god of Olympus would never set foot in the fox's den again. The shinobi of old could tolerate a lot of things, but he wouldn't allow such behavior when families with young children were known to visit daily. Anyone, such as a small child could have stumbled upon them while hoping to use the facilities. For anyone else, he wouldn't have considered the notion of letting Apollo back in, but his old friend was convincing. Hestia was a smooth talker when she needed to be. And so, three days ago, a sheepish-looking Apollo walked inside the den, and his eyes immediately locked with his own. He rarely came across as unwelcoming, but his stone-faced expression made it clear to the god of the sun that he hadn't forgotten what happened the last time he visited. He wanted to make the Olympian sweat a little, or as much as you can on someone who has divine control over the sun. A small group of satyrs had been visiting at the same time, but the moment Apollo walked inside, they took their drinks and left. While his first impression of Apollo had been less than fruitful, he would admit, his fellow blonde did come across as apologetic for his actions. He couldn't feel any negative emotions coming from the Olympian, nor could he detect any hint of deceit in his apology. It appeared genuine. Knowing Hestia, she likely had a stern talk with her nephew, or perhaps his twin had threatened him with violence if he didn't go back and apologize. Hestia spoke to him at length what the reaction had been from the other Olympians, and suffice to say, Artemis had glared bloody murder at him every time they crossed paths on Olympus. When he asked what Athena's reaction had been, Hestia had gone ghost white. She wouldn't say what, but apparently, the goddess of wisdom had been harsh. She motioned her fingers into the shape of scissors and made a snip-snip sound. He understood, and they left it at that. He didn't need an image forming in his head. With the apology made and a promise that such an event would never happen again, Naruto had accepted, though warned that he didn't want to repeat in the future. He was on thin ice as it was, and he would be keeping a close eye on him during his visits. Apollo nodded profusely and promised he wouldn't give in to temptation again. The old shinobi tried not to snort at the claim, knowing the sun god's reputation, but agreed nonetheless. Believing the conversation was over, Naruto had started to move away when he noticed the golden god staring at him, remaining in the same spot. Asking if there was something else he could do for him, the Olympian surprised him when he asked if he could book out the fox's den for an afternoon. He explained his sister had done the same thing over a month ago and wanted to do the same. It didn't take a genius to know that Apollo was talking about Artemis. Apparently, the goddess of the moon was bragging about it to her Olympian siblings. Try as he might to keep the smirk from growing on his face, the corners of his lips edged up at the mention of Apollo's twin. She hadn't visited in a few weeks, but he was always on the lookout for her. He was dubious at first. He only just gave the sun god permission to return to the fox's den, and perhaps he was trying to push his luck a bit too quickly. His initial response was to decline the request and wait until Apollo proved himself good on his promises. However, seeing the hopeful look on the immortal's face, and in a good mood after a restful Sunday off, Naruto agreed and allowed it. Like his previous reservation, Naruto briefly disappeared to his office, before returning with his red business diary, and opened it to May. They were in the final week of May, and Naruto hadn't forgotten about the meeting he was due in the coming fortnight. He and Hestia had briefly spoken about it, but little more needed to be said. They knew what needed to happen. All he needed to do was wait until the goddess of the hearth could confirm a date that she would bring her youngest sibling and king. Putting his future meeting with the god of the sky aside, and getting the fees for renting his workplace for the afternoon out the way, he penciled Apollo down in the diary. A party of five, including Apollo, would dine at the fox's den on the Friday of next week and would arrive at midday. There were no dietary restrictions he needed to watch, which was a bonus, and food and beverages would be covered by the fee Apollo already paid. Apollo didn't offer a blank check like Mr. Black, 
but it was enough to cover his group. It was still more than he expected. Perhaps the sun god was true to his word. Afterwards, Apollo had run out with a giddy expression thanking him and disappearing down the street. That was over a week ago, and the day of said reservation had arrived. Hestias had agreed to babysit Thalia for him, which meant he didn't need to leave a clone in his place to care for her. The little girl appeared disappointed that he wasn't spending the day with them, but her frown quickly turned into a gleeful expression when he promised to take her to the zoo on Sunday. Before leaving the house, she gave him the biggest hug she could muster before running off into the living room where Hestia was waiting with some more coloring books and new crayons. Patiently waiting and watching as the hands on the clock ticked by, he straightened his back when he felt a flicker of energy come to life down the street. He only had to wait half a minute before the blonde Olympian waltzed on inside. Wearing regular civilian clothes did little to dial back the sun god's natural masculine beauty, his hair tied into a bun like the first time they met in a pair of sunglasses sitting on his face. A backpack was over his right shoulder and appeared in good spirits if the giant grin on his face was any indication. Seeing as this was a fresh start for the pair, Naruto wore a polite smile as Apollo crossed the room, right on time. Midday on the dot. Hey. When I promise something, I keep my word. If I say I'll be there at midday, I'll be there at midday. He replied, taking off his sunglasses and showing off his bright blue eyes. They were practically glowing with excitement. In fact, staring at him Naruto noticed the blonde Olympian couldn't keep still and was bouncing on the balls of his feet. He looked like a happy golden retriever about to chase his favorite tennis ball. I guess so. He looked Apollo square in the eye, you look like you woke up on the right side of the bed. Something like that. It's a beautiful day to be alive. Do you want to know why? Naruto shrugged, sure, why not? Apollo leaned forward, his grin widening, because it's game day. He placed his backpack on the ground, and wandered over to the tables, do you mind if I rearrange your tables? I need a specific layout once the rest of the group appear. The old shinobi gave the sun god a flat stare, moving the tables around before he had a chance to answer. A sliver of annoyance flashed through him, but pushed it away, sure, go right ahead. He paid to rent the den out, and if he wanted to rearrange some furniture, then he could. Walking out from behind the counter, he gave Apollo a hand in moving tables and pushing spares off to the side. Working together, it only took a few minutes before they had the layout he desired. Soon enough, a U-shape of tables formed, while a second table sat in the middle and a third was a few feet in front of them. Naruto found himself curious about what kind of game they were intending on playing. It wasn't like anything he'd seen before. He was about to ask why, when the next person started to arrive. An eyebrow rose on his face, and he tried to repress a smirk from forming on his face as a familiar dark-haired immortal with elfish features appeared through the windows and entered the den. Unlike the last time, he was wearing civilian clothes instead of his postman attire and looked significantly well-rested. The dark lines beneath his eyes were gone, leaving only a healthy light-skinned complexion. Like Apollo, a backpack was across his shoulder. Apollo. The sun god spun around, and both wore expressions of equal excitement, Hermes. The pair of Olympians embraced in a tight hug before both shook their fists in excitement. What day is it? Game day. Hermes ran a hand through his curly dark hair, it's been too long, man. I need my fix. It's all I've been thinking about for the past couple of days. He poked his older brother in the chest with his index finger, you better have something good planned. Hey, it's me. Apollo opened his arms wide, I always deliver on the goods. Don't worry about it, Herm. When do the others get here? Any minute now. I only arrived a few minutes ago myself. Nodding, Hermes looked across the room, and only now noticed the blonde shinobi standing there, casually watching as he and his brother conversed. His eyes narrowed, and his face suddenly turned pouty. Naruto could only imagine he was thinking about the last time they met face to face. It's you. Naruto gave a short wave, it's nice to see you again. It's been a while since you were last here. I was beginning to wonder if you were ever going to stop by again. Instead of answering him, Hermes turned and looked at his brother, does he have to be here? Well, he does own the place. Can't really kick him out of his own business. I mean, we could, 
but then we'd have to deal with Artemis and Athena, and we both know how that will end up for us. Apollo shook his head, and waved his hands in front of him, no thanks. I like being alive. Forgive and forget, Herm. Keep that chin up. He patted his brother's shoulder. The younger Olympian grumbled but conceded to his brother's point. He had no desire to enact the wrath of the moon goddess again. He had no desire to be on Artemis's shit list even more than he already was. She still hadn't forgiven him for the potato incident and would glare at him whenever they crossed paths, or when he made a delivery to her hunt. I guess, he muttered, looking to and from Naruto and Apollo. Like everyone else who'd visited, he made a note of the similarities between the owner and Apollo. Leaning in, he whispered, are you sure he's not one of yours? Apollo turned and gave Naruto a glance from the corner of his eye, before replying, I'm pretty sure. I don't feel any of my power lingering within him like the rest of my kids. I think it's just coincidence. He couldn't fault Hermes for asking the question. He wondered the same on his first visit with Aphrodite, before coming to the conclusion he didn't belong to his demigod brood. He doubted Artemis would like him as much as she did if he was. She could be very picky when it came to his kids. If you say so. Hermes looked over at Naruto, who smiled back politely. The Olympian's right hand came up with his middle and index finger forming a V-shape and made the, I'm watching you, motion. He wasn't going to let the damn blonde draw another phallus on his forehead like last time. People were still making fun of him because of it. It wasn't long before the pair became a trio. This time a young woman appeared before them, and this one the blonde shinobi didn't recognize. She was short in stature in comparison to the men in the room, barely reaching the middle of their chests. She was young in comparison too. If he had to put a number on her, he would have guessed 16. Maybe 17. Either way, she was younger than he was expecting for the intended party. Her hair was long and black like a raven's feather, and tied in a loose-fitting ponytail and her eyes a shade of brown like melted chocolate. She was a god, he could tell that much, or in this case, a goddess though didn't expect one to appear so young. Then again, Hestia enjoyed slipping into her child form from time to time. Despite her youth, she was a pretty little thing. The girl took in the room, appearing fascinated by the interior of the room. When she turned and faced the pair of gods that were watching her, she made a couple of steps forward before tripping over her own feet and face planting right into the wood of the floor. The pair of gods and the shinobi winced at the dull thud that came with impact, and all three made a motion to move forward and help her. To their surprise, her hand came up, telling them to stop. She pushed herself to her feet and huffed in annoyance. All three watched as she dusted herself off before looking back at Apollo and Hermes with a determined look on her face, and held both her fists in the air in front of her. Game day. Game day. Both repeated and embraced the young girl in a hug, with Hermes adding, Glad you could make it Hebe. A look of understanding crossed Naruto's face, though he quickly hid it. A-H-H, so that's Hebe. He thought. Her appearance now made sense, given her status as the goddess of youth. The youngest daughter of Zeus and Hera, she was a reclusive member of the Greek pantheon when compared to the rest of her siblings. There were few stories about Hebe, with the most prominent being the part she played in aiding Iolaus and temporarily granted him his youth once more to fight Eurys Theus. That story aside, the most prominent piece of information on Hebe was being the former cupbearer of the gods, and the wife of the famous hero, Heracles. According to Hestia, Hebe mostly kept to herself, choosing to stay in her temple most days that sat off to the side near her mother's grand temple. As if I'd miss it. We've got a lot of work to do brother, so don't mess it up. She waged her finger up at Hermes, who appeared amused by the action as her face puffed out like a chipmunk, you get too carried away, and I won't let you make any silly mistakes. Not today. Hermes appeared affronted at the notion, I get carried away? Who's the one who forgets about personal space when things heat up? The goddess appeared affronted by his claim, and fired back, it's not that bad. Don't be so dramatic. Hermes. Last time, you punched me in the eye. Oh, that was a love tap at best. How is it my fault you bruise like a peach? Learn to dodge, Mr. Fastest God on Olympus. The dark-haired god turned to his blonde brother, and motioned, can you believe this? Next to them, Apollo snorted, she's right, 
you know. You do bruise like a peach. I can second that. And I can third that. You bruise pretty easily for a member of our family. Two new voices spoke up, and Naruto soon found himself staring at the final two members of Apollo's party. The first was male and stood the tallest in the room by at least a couple of inches. His shoulders were significantly broader than his own, with a deep tan and scarred hands like an old-time fisherman. His hair was black, and tied into a bun similar to Apollo, though unlike the sun god, had a fair amount of dark stubble across his face. The jacket he wore was open too, revealing he wasn't wearing a shirt beneath and showing off his well-kept body. The second person was a woman, with long hair that was kept free from any braid or ponytail, hanging loosely down her back like a beautiful curtain of wheat gold. Her eyes were a shade of green, though much lighter than the man next to her. While his eyes were the color of the sea, hers were more of a mossy shade. A gold bracelet shaped like a laurel sat on her left wrist, while a small pair of earrings shaped like poppies dangled from her ears. She appeared older than Hebe, and was equally as attractive. Triton. Dispoina. The excitement in her cousin's voice was enough to make the Dispoina giggle at his reaction. Hiba was the first one to cross the room, grabbing her in a tight hug, while Apollo and Hermes greeted their elder cousin from the sea. He was a rarity to see the son of Poseidon outside of his father's realm. Compared to his Olympian cousins, Triton took his duties bequeathed to him by his father as serious as a god could, and rarely took days off. Although not an Olympian, Triton was respected by most, with many believing it was his work ethic Athena tried to emulate during her days as a younger and inexperienced goddess. Many tended to forget it was Triton who kept a watch over her when she first arrived. There was stability with Triton that few gods in their pantheon could claim to possess. Not to mention, when he had a few of Dionysus's wines in him, he loosened up and became the life of the party. Sorry if we're a little late. The god's voice was notably deeper than his cousin's and nodded his head towards the goddess next to him idly chatting away with Hebe, I ran into this one, who was gushing over some baked bread in a nearby bakery a few blocks over. Nah, it's cool, it's cool. We just got here too. Hello, Triton. This time, Hebe turned to her older cousin and laughed as she found herself hooking her arms around his neck and dangling off the front of his body without a care in the world. Said God tried to look annoyed but was failing miserably. Dispoina embraced her two cousins, before asking, still no Dionysus then. The god of wine and youngest Olympian was a regular member of their group, though was sadly unable to play as of late due to defying his father and not being able to control his urges. Nah, no luck. I tried to convince dad to give him a pass for one day, but you know what my old man is like. Apollo explained, shivering at the memory of his father glaring at him for bringing the subject up again. He tried every time they all got together, but his father wouldn't budge. Why did Dionysus have to go after that nymph? Even Apollo, the biggest ladies' man on Olympus would refrain from seducing someone declared off-limits by Zeus. Well, he's only got himself to blame. Triton added, before finally taking note of the third blonde in the room standing patiently of to the side as they had their conversation, who's the mortal? It came out quietly, watching as Naruto wore a patient smile as the rest of the newcomers took note of him. A menace to society, Hermes muttered, though felt Apollo wedge his elbow into his side. That's Mr. Uzumaki. He generously let us borrow his diner for the day. Naruto nodded their way, please, just call me Naruto. And did you, you know, Triton added and made a swirl motion with his fingers. Use the mist. Triton nodded, of course. I wrapped this place so thick in the mist people will be walking past it without so much as batting this place a glance. It'll cover our conversations too with him, so we don't need to worry about stepping on any glass. The older god seemed pleased, good. I would hate to have a repeat of Mulligan's steakhouse. That was four years ago. And I didn't know she was clear-sighted. As the three boys conversed, Hebe and Dispoina took it upon themselves to walk over and greet the smiling blonde. Of course, like everyone else in their family, they'd heard the rumors floating around this place. The daughter of Demeter heard all about it from Persephone after one of their many afternoon tea sessions with their mother on the balcony of her temple. Her sister never spoke about any mortal business in such high regard before, and though Demeter initially appeared interested, said interest waned when Persephone mentioned how much Hades enjoyed it. 
For Hebe, it was a similar scenario, though for her it came from the lips of Artemis during one of the monthly gatherings at Hestia's hearth between the goddesses. Any mortal that could make the goddess of the moon swoon and praise him was enough for her to investigate. Sorry for their loudness. I'm afraid the boys in our family don't know the volume of their voices. Despoina apologized, some of the women too. The blonde smiled at the pair, that's okay. I take it this is your first time to the fox's den. It is, yes. From beneath the counter, Naruto pulled out a small stack of menus and handed one to each of the women, here, take one of these and see if there's anything you fancy on them. Since you'll likely be here for most of the day, you can order whatever you want, whenever you want. I'll be sitting here at the counter while you're in the middle of your, he paused, before adding, game. Both girls looked at each other, and broke out into giggles, Apollo didn't tell you much, did he? The blonde shook his head, nothing at all. Apollo appeared between the two goddesses, wrapping his arms over their shoulders and grinned at Naruto, yo. Do you think we could get some of those milkshakes I had the last time I was here? Those were the best. He looked over his shoulders, Triton. Hermes. You guys want a milkshake? They're amazing. I'll take a strawberry. That came from Hermes, who took his place around the table. His backpack was on his lap, unzipping the top and grabbing a few items out from inside. On the opposite side, Triton did the same, and replied with, Mint for me, if you have it. You got it. Apollo nudged his sister and cousin, ladies. A vanilla milkshake would be nice. I haven't had a milkshake in forever. Despoiner replied, a pout forming her face, Mother never lets me have one where we're together, which is all the time. She loved Demeter Deary, but the goddess of the harvest was too clingy and fussy. She was a grown goddess. She could make her own choices. I think I will have an Aria milkshake, thank you very much, Hebe answered, giving the menu a quick askim before settling on her choice. And I'll have a chocolate milkshake. Naruto gave a small salute, all right, I'll have those ready for you shortly. Why don't you guys go start your game, and I'll bring them over to you. With that, Naruto disappeared into the back room to begin the preparations. Meanwhile, the five gods made their way to the tables, and each took their places. And we're done. Naruto muttered to himself, crouched down by one of the tables in the kitchen as he lowered the final cherry delicately on top of the whipped cream floating on the surface of the chocolate milkshake. Together, five milkshakes of equal height with the classic red and white striped straws were carefully lifted until perfectly balanced on the tips of his fingers, not too shabby if I say so myself. Pushing the door open, he and re-entering the main room, he wasn't sure what he was expecting to find. Maybe they were playing a board game. Monopoly or something. They all had large bags with them, so anything was possible. He wondered if Thalia had played any and if he should get some for them to play in the evenings. Instead, what he found nearly made him stumble from the absurdity of what he was witnessing. At some point, someone, probably Apollo, must have closed the blinds and turning the lighting down. Across the tables he and Apollo put together, black cloth covered them, notepads and various sized dice splayed out in front of the players. Apollo, who was seated at the table not attached to the larger arrangement, was sat with a dark cloak covering his body, the hood pulled up to cover the top half of his face. A cardboard screen was up to shield whatever objects and notes he had laid out in front of him. Welcome travelers, Apollo spoke as he stood up and looked across the players in front of him, welcome to this week's game. As always, I, Apollo, will be your dungeon master. One quick announcement. Like I said earlier, the Diabolical Five will be without Wisteriax the Tifling Sorcerer. As we all know, D couldn't keep it in his pants and can't join us until I manage to crack Dad. Around the U-shaped table, the other members of the party, or the Diabolical Five as he learned, nodded their heads. Each one had a change of attire, and each one of them looked like they belonged with King Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table. The first he looked at was Hebe, who now had her hair tied up in a bun, and dressed in some form of grey armor with a blue SC air lightly wrapped around her neck. Hermes appeared to be wearing a bright purple shirt and brown pants, with a flute hanging from his belt and his hair slicked back. A white waistcoat sat over the shirt, and he wore something akin to a smirk, or a grin. He couldn't tell which. Despoina, meanwhile, 
was dressed in robes of various shades of green, orange and brown. On her head sat a crown of thorns along with a wooden staff in her left hand. To finish it off, Triton had removed his jacket, and a viking-like helmet sat on his head. A large axe sat on his back. Are you guys playing Dungeons and Dragons? He asked, disbelief very evident in his voice. Sure am, Apollo said, breaking character as he ushered Naruto forward, his eyes lingering on the milkshakes on the tray. Walking over and handing everyone their shake, he watched as Apollo brought it up to his mouth and took a long swig as the frothy goodness ran down the back of his throat. Oh man, that's the stuff. Hmm. <laughs> the hum came from Hebe, who beneath the table was kicking the air with her short legs, it's so good. A milkshake mustache coated the top of her lips, and plucked the cherry from the top of the cream, how's your dispoina? The goddess didn't say anything. Her expression was one of bliss, her vanilla milkshake overpowering her in a way she hadn't expected. Yeah, it's pretty good, I guess, Hermes muttered. He couldn't deny how good the beverage was, though he still kept an eye on the blonde from the corner of his eyes. He didn't want to leave himself open. Triton, who sat opposite the god of messengers, nodded in agreement. The prince of the sea thought it was the best milkshake he'd ever had. So, Naruto started, his mind finally catching up to him, you guy do this often? When you said you were going to play games, I thought you meant Monopoly or Cluedo. We tried that, but it got violent very quickly, Triton answered, with Naruto noticing they all turned to stare at Hibei, who huffed and crossed her arms, someone doesn't take losing well. I told you all time and time again. Don't touch Park Lane and Mayfair. Those are my squares. The goddess of youth shot back. You didn't own them at the time, which means it's all free real estate. You were just angry that I managed to bankrupt you. Cause you build hotels on them, which was my plan. We can all get very competitive, Dispoina added, her smile returning and gently sipping from the straw in the corner of her mouth, and laughed as Heba blew Raspberry Triton's way, some more than others. Looking back up at him, Dispoina asked, Have you ever played, Mr. Uzumaki? With that question, everyone turned and looked at him. Shaking his head, and rubbing the back of his neck, Naruto replied with, I haven't. I don't know much about the game to be honest. All I know is that it was popular back in the 80s. I think I've seen books on it in local bookshops and the dice. We started playing the game about five years ago, and we haven't played much else since. It's very immersive, though we don't get to play as often as we'd like. Our professions and responsibilities tend to get in the way. She put her milkshake down, and Naruto found himself surprised as her voice suddenly changed into one of smooth elegance, My name is Anaraxia, a druid half-elf and primary healer for the group. She nudged Hermes and gave him a look to follow suit. Sighing, the male god cleared his throat and made his voice sound higher pitched, The name's Rolf, a bard gnome and the best dem flute player you'll ever see. Nice to meet you. Next. It was Heba's turn, who stood up and laid her fist on her chest, I'm Lena, I'm human, and I'm the, Heba sighed and whispered, the cleric. Naruto took note of how unhappy she sounded about it, and her lip stuck out in a pout. You don't sound happy about it. He commented and heard everyone else in the party snort. Heba sat back down in a huff and crossed her arms. The youngest looking member was proving to possess a bit of a temper. She's not. Every other campaign we've played, she always picks a barbarian or a fighter. She never allocates herself as the healer, Apollo replied, lacing his fingers behind his head and looking over at his half-sister, so we told her she had to suck it up and be the cleric of the group. So the cleric is a healer. Everyone nodded, then why is, he looked over at Dispoina, Anaraxia year primary. Again, everyone looked at Hebe, who stuck her tongue out and grinned. Triton who had a small bead of mint-flavored milkshake running down his beard, went on to explain, clerics have to pick domains to align their abilities with and pick a god to serve as their patron. They're holy warriors to be blunt. Heba here, picked the war domain, which makes her suitable for both healing support, and fighting. Guess which she chooses to focus on. And it's a good thing I did. How many times have I saved your sorry butts? Heba spoke, eyes full of passion, I'm a warrior at heart. I belong on the front line just like Tyrogue, and Wisteriax. Yes, yes, of course. Tyrogue. 
Naruto asked though it wasn't too hard to figure out. Putting down his milkshake, Triton was the final member to stand up. He put on a low voice, like waves smashing against a stone beach, I am the one they call Tyrogue. He lifted the plastic axe and put it on his shoulder, I'm the half-goliath barbarian of this group, and the primary ass-kicker and skull-crusher. Need monsters to kill? I'm your man. He grinned and stuck his tongue out at Hibei, who returned the gesture. If the blonde shinobi had to guess, the daughter of the king and queen preferred to play the barbarian. That's the group. Apollo looked up at him from his seat behind the table, we have one more, but he's was grounded by our dad, and put on house arrest. Maybe you'll get to meet him in the future. Maybe. Naruto replied, so you guys do this often. When we have time, but we try to do it once a month if we can. The blonde nodded, all right. In that case, I'll leave you guys to play. If you need anything, I'll be sitting by the counter. Making sure everyone around the table had a menu should they decide they wanted anything, Naruto made way to the counter, and took his seat. He had a book to read for the afternoon, but something told him he didn't want to miss what was about to unfold in front of him. Watching the group play their game was an experience he was unlikely to forget any time soon. He knew of the game, but he'd never seen it played before. From what he understood, it was an action role-playing game, with one person acting as the narrator of the story, or campaign in this case, while the rest would play characters they created. They went in depth, like their character's history, personality likes and dislikes. He couldn't speak for anyone else who played the game, but the five gods around the table appeared very passionate and committed to the game. Three hours in, and his book remaining untouched, Naruto found himself leaning on his elbows as he watched them. As you guys push on further northward for another two hours through the ever-changing grass, you begin to notice the color of the grass begin to shift and change the further north you go, Apollo described, looking across the room with his fingers laced in front of him, starting from the deep verdant green we're all familiar with, it changes into a maroon, purplish color. Whoa. What's up with this field? Hermes chittered away, feigning surprise as he looked around the room, it's like some big kaleidoscope. I would like to pop Henry out of my bracelet, he be added and tapped her wrist. Nodding, Apollo made a whooshing sound and began describing Heba's pet wolf appearing, Henry appears on the field, and started sniffing around. Nose to the ground, you all watch as Henry walks over to a small patch of daisies, and begins rolling over the flowers with his body. Ah, Henry likes all the flowers. Hebe raised her hand and pretended to pat a creature that wasn't there. The only one who didn't look amused out of the bunch was Dispoina, who lunged forward in her seat, her arms out wide. A frantic look is on her face, her crown of thorns threatening to topple off her head. Don't do that. You'll make the field angry. She pretended to get in front of the make-believe wolf, her arms going wild, it'll be angry for weeks. It might try and hurt us. Triton and Hermes looked confused and amused, while Heba frowned at her cousin. She pretended to hug her make-believe wolf while saying, Anna. Do not yell at my wolf. I was trying to protect him. Afterwards, Apollo begins to describe Henry the wolf rolling through the grass again, with everyone watching as Dispoina's expression relaxed and stared at Apollo, does it seem angry? No, it's all fine. The field carries on as normal. Oh. It went silent for a moment, everyone looking at the blonde goddess and waited for her response. They didn't have long to wait before Dispoina's face turned into a mask of fury, as her feet repeatedly stamped on the ground, suck at grass. The moment you say that the grass goes from a purplish maroon, into a deep red. Hermes dropped his head into his hands, while Dispoina looked like a fish out of the water, oh god. What did you do? I don't know. You said everything was fine. She accused Apollo, pointing at him with an annoyed expression. I said it was fine for a wolf to roll on the grass. I didn't say it was okay to flat out insult the field. Apollo reasoned with, as all of you begin to continue forward, you find the grass is getting denser the further you go and begins catching on your ankles. You're all close to falling over a few times, but you manage to catch yourself. You get the distinct feeling the field wants you gone. Triton sighed, looking at his half-sister with a tired expression, you turned a field against us. Good job. He turned to Apollo, do we have to fight it? That's up to you. 
I could torch the field. I think I've got a casket of oil in my bag of holding. From across the room, Naruto watched in fascination. It was preposterous, and yet it was happening in front of him. No. Don't do that. Hiba looked over at Apollo, I jump on Tyrogue and cover his face with my hands, stopping him from taking out the casket. Triton flailed his arms around, A-H-H. Get off me, you pitiful excuse of a cleric. Being the only silent one, as Dispoina started doing some strange dance to try and calm the down the field, Hermes let out a low sigh, and go Apollo's attention, I'm going to try and reason with the field. He took a sip of water and cleared his throat, lovely field. I apologize for the rudeness of my compatriots. We will be gentle as we meander our way through you. We will make as little of a mark on your magnificence as we can and enjoy the splendor of your ever-changing colors. You are majestic. You are windswept. You are everything I could hope for in a field of your radiance. It was a delight to set foot on your soil, and thank you for taking such good care of us. Apollo tried to hold in his laughter, as did Naruto, before asking, Ralph. Please make a persuasion check against the grass, while adding the d10 inspiration die. Shall do. Prepare to thank me for saving you all again. Hermes picked up one of the die and rolled it across the table. He pondered over it for a moment before he looked back at Apollo, 12. Your parley with the field was unsuccessful. Fuck. You rolled a 2. He be questioned, glancing over at his dice. Hey. We all have bad rolls from time to time. Now let's get the hell out of this field before we piss it off any more than we have. I think I need some cake, Dispoina muttered and motioned Naruto over, could I get some lemon bars please? A short while later, and a couple of empty plates extra, Naruto once again found himself staring quizzically at the fivesome. If anyone was passing by the fox's den at this moment, he could only imagine what their reaction was going to be after hearing the exaggerated screams of the son of the sea. The party of four successfully made it through the field without angering the rainbow-colored meadow further and found themselves traveling through a narrow pathway that led up towards the mountain. However, before they could get very far, Apollo described a golem made of stone blocking their path and refusing to allow them passage. Hebe, being the practical joker of the group, decided to use a technique called polymorph and turned the golem into something else entirely. Will someone please get this thing away from me? Triton shouted, holding up a plastic shield as he pretended to get knocked back by an invisible creature, whose plan was it to polymorph the golem into a giant squirrel. You know I don't like squirrels. They have it out for me. He made a bunch of nonsensical noises, which were soon followed by, stop standing there and help me. Hermes stared over at his half-sister since Heba was the one who cast polymorph on the golem, why did you turn it into a squirrel? You knew what the outcome was going to be. This is the fourth time it's happened this campaign. And it gets funnier every time it happens, Hebe replied, trying not to laugh at the nonsensical babbling coming from Triton. You'd think he was fighting Rotosk. Dispoina added, focusing partly on the scene in front of her, while happily nomming away on a lemon bar, a squirrel that size would get problematic. I don't know how Frey and the others deal with such an annoying creature, Apollo added, watching his cousin in amusement. It was always good to see his serious cousin of the sea get into role-playing and act like someone the polar opposite, I know Artie had been half-tempted to hunt it down on a few occasions. Die. 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 The sea god swung the shield around like a bat, help me. Is anyone brave enough to jump in and help your poor barbarian? Apollo asked, sitting there in amusement as his cousin got bested by a giant squirrel, otherwise, this could take a while. Lena. Hermes and Dispoina said, looking at Hebe, who appeared to be enjoying the sight immensely. Her shoulders were shaking up and down with Triton's shouts and screams tickling her funny bone, did you have to make it so big? It was funny. Heba shrugged, but felt the eyes of everyone else bore into her, oh fine. I'll turn it into something smaller. She waved a hand in the air, I use polymorph again. What do you turn it into? The goddess of youth shrugged, no idea. How about a snail? He nodded, with a wave of her hand, Lena uses polymorph one more time and altered the form of the squirrel. You all watch as the body of the furry critter shudders for a moment before it shrinks in size and takes on a new shape. 
What's left in its place is an ordinary snail, one that immediately begins slowly moving towards Tyrogue. The sun god described as Triton let out a sigh of relief, before glaring over at Hebe. Are you all happy now? Hebe asked in character, before turning to Triton, come on, you big baby. Let's get going. We have a dragon to kill at the peak of that mountain. That thing will stay in that form for an hour, so let's get away from here and conserve our strength. My weapon is burning for some real action. Here's your coffee. Naruto offered, lowering a mug of freshly brewed goodness next to Triton, I added a splash of coconut in there as you asked, and didn't add any sugar. Thank you, Triton replied, taking it eagerly in his hands and taking small sips, trying to avoid burning his tongue. The content hum was low and gave a series of nods, I can see why this place is so popular. I'm beginning to wonder if I should tell my mother about this place. She's been looking for more reasons to frequent New York, and if she knew this place existed, then she would stop by every visit. In that case, I'll have to keep an eye out for her. If you like, you can take a menu with you to show her. I'm still trying to figure out the whole website thing. It was an idea Hestia had offered him. He liked the idea of putting up a website for the Fox's Den so people could view the menu without having to come in. Plus it would give people a way to book the place out for events and alike. He wasn't the most tech-savvy people out there in that regard. I just might. Thank you for the offer. Don't mention it. Looping around the table to pick up some empty plates, he listened in as he beheld her hands tightly together as she shook the dice around in her palms. He wasn't a hundred percent sure what was happening, having been going back and forth between the kitchen and the group. Everyone on the table suddenly had the urge for a stack of pancakes each, spearheaded by Apollo, while he described the battle they were stuck in with a dragon that could breathe ice. If he had it correct, then Heba was about to make a roll that could make or break their group. Despoina's character was low on health having been knocked down once already, while Hermes was hidden behind a boulder, trying to stay out of the way from the dragon's icy breath. Triton had rolled moments earlier and dealt 20 points of damage before Heba began her turn. The battle as a whole had taken over an hour. Come on lucky dice, don't fail me now. The goddess of youth whispered, muttering something beneath her breath. Lucky dice. Naruto whispered, but Triton waved it off. She can be superstitious like that. Remember, you can't pray to Dick. That's cheating. Apollo added, giving her a look. The goddess of youth had performed that little trick in the past resulting in Apollo having to ban the activity. I won't. Shaking the dice one last time, Hebe rolled them across the table and leaned in, 18. She started going over her notes, add an extra 5. That makes it 23. 23 points of damage. Apollo whistled. Everyone waited with bated breath as Apollo went over his notes, making some small calculations in his head, before looking back at Hebe, not bad at all. How do you want to do this? Elated whoops erupted from around the table, though none were as loud as Hebas, who punched the air and stamped her feet like a happy schoolgirl. If the blonde shinobi had to guess, that meant the group had won the battle, and Hebe got to decide how to kill the dragon. The dragon had exactly 23 health points left. Good job. Apollo commented, so. Rubbing her hands together. The normally happy-go-lucky child of Zeus and Hera rubbed her hands together in a devilish manner, truly giving into her character's bloodthirsty tendencies, I want it to go a little something like this. I want to run to the dragon and climb up its back, using the spikes on its body like climbing hooks. When I get close enough to the head, I'm going to swing my sword and drive it through its icy blue eye. She grinned viciously. Hermes leaned away from her, worried her idle hands my looks someone to catch off guard but I won't stop there. With every ounce of strength I have, I pull it to the ground, the sword still attached through the eye. With its head resting on the ground, I draw it out and pierce it right between the eyes. I kneel, and watch as the light darkens in its eyes. Around the table, everyone just looked at her, though none looked as taken aback than Naruto did. Granted she was only playing a character, but he never expected to hear something so brutal escape the lips of a goddess who was known to be one of the kindest to be around. All Hebe could do was give everyone a sweet little smile, as everyone half-heartedly listened to Apollo describe the scene back to them. Letting out a yawn, Naruto rested against the counter. 
Looking at the clock, he could see the hands were drawing close to 8 p.m. As he mentioned to Apollo the other day, that was the cut-off point for the evening. As fun as the day went, he was looking forward to heading home and putting his feet up. When the god of the sun finished his description and turned to his direction, the blonde shinobi gave a quick motion to the clock on the wall, to which his fellow blonde quickly understood. He watched as Apollo slowly started bringing their game to a close. Later that evening. I'm home, Naruto called, closing the door to his home shut and slipping off his shoes. The smell of dinner and balking hung in the air, enough for it to tickle his nose with a delightful aroma. It wasn't long after walking through did the sound of small feet reach his ears and found himself smiling as Thalia appeared from the living room, her head appearing from behind the arch. The daughter of Zeus was dressed for bed, and her hair was damp in places, indicating Hestia had already given her niece her nightly bath. Mr. Naruto. The girl bolted down the hallway, and the blonde shinobi found himself catching her and hoisting her up with one arm. Isn't it meant to be your bedtime? What are you still doing up? He asked, smiling down at her, I thought I would find you asleep by now, or did you twist your auntie's arm and convince her to let you stay up later? All he got was a giggle in response, making him chuckle at her reaction. With that comment, the face of Hestia appeared from the living room, and followed after her niece in greeting him, she wanted to be here for when you arrived home. We made an apple pie together today, and she wants to watch you eat it. She worked very hard on making it for you. She patted Thalia's hair, we made it from scratch, didn't we? Yup. Did you now? He smiled, bouncing Thalia in the air as the little girl nodded, well isn't that sweet? He kissed the top of her head, and watched her beam a smile at him, was it fun? Duh. -huh. Lots. Auntie showed me how to chop apples. Well, let's not keep that pie waiting. Do you remember where the bowls are? Thalia got the message, and quickly dropped to the ground with a soft thud and darted for the kitchen, looks like you two had fun today. She certainly keeps things lively, and I can't deny it's not a joy to be around her. Hestia replied, leaning against the wall with her arms crossed, more importantly, how was your day with my nephews and nieces? He sighed, and moved past her and walked towards the kitchen where Thalia was waiting for him, your family is so weird, Hestia. Hestia laughed stepping away from the wall and looping her arm through his, I've been telling you that for years. Now you know what I've been dealing with for over 5 millennia. That's it for part 7. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.